Hello everybody, welcome to Field Trips with the New York State Museum. My name is Carl Morell, and today we're at the historic New York State Education Building. Behind me is the rotunda. The rotunda is on the second floor of the New York State Education Building, and it's one of the most magnificent spaces in the building. But before we take a look at it, I want to talk about a little about the history of this building and the history of the department. The New York State Education Building, or the New York State Education Department, was founded in 1904. And in 1904, they brought together two organizations that were overseeing education in New York at that time. One of them was the Board of Regents. The Board of Regents was founded in 1784, and originally, they oversaw the colleges in New York State. In 1854, we had the development of the Department of Public Instruction, and they oversaw the, college, the uh, high schools and academies. New York, New York sought to have one education system for all New Yorkers across all levels. And so that was the idea to form the New York State Education Department. So in 1904, we have this new department overseeing education uh, across all the levels, uh, including higher education, libraries, museums, and also the licensing of numerous professions in the state. The original department was located in the New York State Capitol. This building was not constructed yet. Uh, the first commissioner of education, Andrew Slim Draper, originally uh, was dissatisfied with the space they were given in the Capitol. They had the collections of the library, the collections of the museum, they had a lot of the administrative staff of the new department, uh, and space, it, it became very tight and cramped there. Andrew Sloan Draper suggests that a new building be constructed for this department. No state had its own building solely dedicated uh, to the education department. Uh, new York, uh, Andrew Sloan Draper gets people to his side, he, lobbies, the legislature, he gets a lot of the educational leaders uh, around this, this idea. And in 1906, the state approved money for the construction of the building. They make the announcement that they're going to be constructing uh, what would be the first ever education building in the United States. No state had had one uh, on its own. Uh, and they begin, they begin accepting submissions from, across, uh, from different architects across the state and the country. Uh, they received a very impressive plan from a New York City architect. His name was Henry Hornbostel. Uh, Hornbostel was trained in Paris at the famous Ecole de Beaux Arts. Uh, he was trained in classical architecture. Uh, and for his submission uh, for the education building, his plan looked like, uh, from the outside, a Greek cathedral, a Greek temple. And on the inside, uh, they had all these lovely, magnificent spaces uh, to look at with a lot of architectural features. Part of the plan for the building was it wasn't only going to be the administrative quarters for the New York State Education Department, but it was also going to have the New York State Museum and the New York State Library. So the building, the plan was a, a, a twofold function. It was going to be these administrative quarters, but it was also a public cultural institution. The public came here to the library, came to visit the museum. Uh, so construction begins in 1908. It takes about four years. In 1912, the building is open for business. and to do their studies at the library. So behind me, like I mentioned, is the Rotunda, which is actually where the original New York State Library used to be. Uh, it moved out in 1978 across the plaza to the Cultural Education Center, uh, and that's where we, we work in the museum. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, talk about a little bit of the architectural space behind me. This is the Rotunda. Uh, the, the offices of the Education Department still remain in the building. Um, it's kind of neat that they get to work uh, former spaces that were the public. But let's take a walk into the rotunda and look at some of the uh, features and, and take a look at some of the art. First thing you'll notice, uh, the, the room uh, in the ceiling, we have these barrel vaults. The roof uh, is made of skylights, so it makes use of a, nat a lot of natural skylights. One of the first things to point out here in the barrel vaults is these decorative bands. Uh, and you'll notice that there's an animal head that repeats every so often. You see it here, I'm shining my light on it. Of course, that's the owl. The owl, of course, is a symbol of wisdom um, and education. The Greek goddess of learning, Athena, is always depicted with an owl. Uh, we always see it used in association with education. So here in the education building, we, we see it decorated here in the, uh, on the band here in the vaults. 
You also notice a lot of classical columns. If you're familiar with the orders of architecture, these are the Dura columns. Uh, and you also notice on what is the entablature above the columns, you'll see an inscription that it starts behind me, but it's the opening motto for the New York State Library. Uh, and it says, here shall be gathered the best books of all lands and all ages, a system of free common schools wherein all the children of the state may be educated. This library aims to uplift the state and serve every citizen, the University of the State of New York. So you have this, this founding motto here. And you see, this, the, this is a pretty Im impressive space. If you look up towards the ceiling, in the upper part of the room, you see what uh, the space is topped off with a rotunda. Uh, and it's a smaller rotunda, uh, but you also notice that there's columns that adorn the upper rows there. If you recognize those, again, another order of architecture, those are the ionic columns. A little bit lower, you'll see one of this is the largest chandelier in the building. It's also very impressive. Um, the, uh, this, the sculptor on this was Charles Keck, pretty, pretty prominent sculptor in the United States. Uh, he, uh, this is silver plated, and it's about 75 feet from the base to the top. Uh, so it's a lovely uh, chandelier that you'll see. Another thing to notice, to point out, is if, uh, if you look on the floor, Part of the plan for the building was not only to be uh, an impressive space, but they wanted to generate this aura of intellectual energy, uh, harking back to the classical civilizations, of course, with education being uh, the overarching idea. So pointing out the floor, you'll notice this cruciform plan. Uh, this, this space, this rotunda, is laid out to the exact specifications of a cathedral. Uh, and that's an intentional, that's an intentional design. The architect wants to impress on you that you're entering uh, this space. This is a, a temple to education. Uh, in, in the case of the rotunda, the, the New York State Library was on, uh, on this floor, which is the second floor. The state had over 3.6 million volumes of books. It wasn't intended that every book would be on this floor. The law library and the medical library was on the floor, and the reading room, which you see off in the distance, which we'll talk about next, uh, there's a series of levels, uh, different floors in the building. There's about six or seven of them. Seven of them. They're called the stacks, and that's where all the other books that the state possessed uh, were located. Now we're going to walk towards the reading room and talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the architectural features that you see there. We had a question just to confirm what floor are we on at the State Education Building? Second floor, which when the library is here, this would be the first public floor. So behind me is the reading room for the original New York State Library. I mentioned in 1978, the library moves out to the Cultural Education Center, and all these former spaces that were once public, like the library, uh, other offices and agencies now occupy these spaces. Uh, today, this, this lovely reading room, the Office of Professions uh, uh, right now inhabits this space. The Office of Professions is the agency that handles all the professional licensing throughout New York State, and there's over a thousand different titles that they certify. And that's what they, they handle, whether you're coming from another state, another country. Um, and it's not only limited to the teaching field. Uh, professions like chiropractors, uh, lawyers, dentists, you all have to, they all have to have professional certification along with the New York State standards. But one of the nicest things about uh, this space is, I mentioned this is probably one of the most lovely offices that you'll ever see, uh, because they get to work in the, the former reading room. So the most impressive aspect of it is the ceiling. If you recognize the ceilings, those are the famous Guastavino vaulted ceilings. Rafael Guastavino, we know, is a Spanish architect and engineer. He's trained in Barcelona. He revives this, this ancient technique uh, that was brought to Spain by the Moors, uh, these, these dome constructions. He perfects it. He makes it his own. Uh, he begins constructing these around Barcelona 
in different public spaces uh, and uh, homes for nobility. Uh, with a lot of the fires that were widespread in the, New York, in the United States at, at, at that time, uh, mid 1880s, uh, Guasavino sees this opportunity to come to the United States uh, and, and sell and construct these, these vaulted ceilings. One of the main aspects of them is because they were made use of terracotta tile, these ceilings were actually fireproof. So when he comes to the United States uh, with his children and his wife at the time, his goal is to construct and sell these ceilings around New York. Uh, during the mid 1880s, New York is, is undergoing a, a large construction boom. So Guastavino finds these opportunities to construct these ceilings. Uh, if you're in the five boroughs, there's over 300 spaces in the five boroughs where you see Guastavino vaulted architecture. Uh, his uh, Guastavino Sr. falls ill in 1907 and passes away. His son, Rafael Jr., Guastavino Jr., continues the family business. They actually have a number of offices throughout the major cities, Boston, Chicago, uh, New York. Uh, and his son continues the family business. And it was Rafael Jr. who actually came to work and, and did the construction on these ceilings uh, here in the New York State Education Building. Uh, he continued the family business to the early 1950s, uh, and then you no longer see these type of constructions. So highly recognizable, uh, highly functional, and also uh, very, very beautiful to look at. We do have a question about the floor again. Is the floor design oriented to compass points? The floor is designed and oriented to com compass points. Uh, it actually aligns with different, uh, the sunlight, the, the building, the building has a southern facing exposure. Uh, and that was also to make use of actual, the, the natural sunlight. But at certain times of the year, you have the sun beaming through the, uh, the, the lunar windows there and it lights up the whole floor, lights up the cruciform. Um, but yes, it is, it is designated to the cardinal points. One of the things that uh, the architect Henry Hornbostel intended was not only was this gonna be the headquarters for the education department, the headquarters for the library, um, but he also wanted to have some art that would adorn the walls, and he didn't want just any art. Uh, he wanted art that was going to carry a theme. Hornbost was looking for an artist that can paint a series of murals to adorn these walls. Uh, he finds the, the work of William Hickok Lowe, uh, and coincidentally, William Hickok Lowe was actually born here in Albany, New York. Uh, he goes to study painting at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Uh, and the teacher he studies under uh, really gets him looking at Greek and Roman figures and forms uh, and painting, painting things along uh, those lines with involving different myths. So when Lowe gets the commission, uh, he has this idea that he's going to paint a series of murals that highlight education, that highlight this quest for knowledge and invention. And he's gonna pair them with Greek and Roman stories. The idea was to show this quest for knowledge, this human quest for knowledge and, and the things that we've accomplished uh, with that quest. So one of, the ones, one of the ones we're looking at here is Theseus. Theseus from the Greek myth. Uh, there's a the myth where he has to go through the labyrinth and slay the Minotaur. He's told to leave a line through the labyrinth so he can find his way out. But here we see Theseus on what is the Adirondacks or the Hudson Valley. And he's following this, this line here. This is an electric line. Uh, and if this is, if you recognize, this is also uh, how telegraph wires uh, were used. Telegraph, this is how we, we communicated information and shared information across distances at that time. Of course, we do not, we no longer use these telegraph wires. And incidentally enough, cities and uh, areas and towns will, will covered with these, these wires, uh, and they would often look like a maze of wires. Like I said, of course, we, we don't use them anymore. So this is, this is typical of, of the time period. Next one we're gonna take a look at. Recognize Icarus from the Greek myth. Icarus is imprisoned in a jail cell with his father. Uh, the, the myth goes that he, devises this escape plan. His plan is to capture fallen bird feathers from his cell. Eventually he would have enough to form wings and 
would use wax and he would form wings and he was going to fly out of the jail cell. That was his escape plan. And he's told not to fly too high to, towards the sun, of course. The sun would melt the wax on the wings. He disobeys this advice. Uh, here's Icarus. He's fallen out of the sky to his death. But if we look at the top, we see an airplane. And so this is signifying the, the, the human quest for flight. We, we have achieved it. This next one is Prometheus. Prometheus is the Titan on Mount Olympus. It is said uh, in the, the Greek myth that he brings the goblet of fire down from Mount Olympus. He teaches humans how to harness its energy and use it. Uh, you see him displayed here. In the background, you see all the uses of fire. Uh, we use fire to power industry, steamships, locomotives. We can melt, melt steel with fire to build bridges. Humans have learned uh, to use the power of fire. This one is Fortuna. She's a Roman goddess of good luck and fortune. You see her holding a purse of gold coins. She's also a big uh, promoter of travel, traveling to distant areas and seeing new lands. Uh, we see her depicted riding a chariot often. But in this, this mural, we see the chariot is buried. It's overgrown. It's no longer used. She's peering out around the tree, and now she's looking on the road, and she sees an automobile, the automobile of that time period. So this is this, this human quest to travel the roads and, and travel across distances. We, we started with the wheel, chariot, and now we have automobiles. We're going to look on the other side, uh, just a couple more on this side I'd like to talk about. This one is Justia. Uh, of course, it's Lady Justice. And you see she's holding the scales of justice. Her sword is drawn. Behind her is the US Capitol, uh, signifying the United States government. And then we see this figure in the front. Um, this, this person has chains that are broken. Of course, this is someone who was a prisoner. So he seems to be celebrating freedom. So this is this, this human aspiration for freedom. We, we've accomplished this with the formation of the United States. We do have a question about why the new, the museum and the archives and the library moved to the current location. That, that would, uh, I'll touch on that in just one second. I'll finish these, these two off real quick. Uh, Veritas, this is, this is probably one of my favorite ones here. Veritas, uh, of course, the goddess of truth. Uh, and in this scene, we see Veritas, there's, she's holding this, this light, this mirror, it's shining this illuminating light onto this, this, this open book here. The writings, uh, the book is the writings of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and also poet and philosopher. Um, she is shining slight of illumination on the wisdom of the past. She's learning all that is to be known from the, the book and uh, from the writings of Marcus Aurelius. But in, in behind her, what's interesting is we see the Sphinx. And we also see this man, this traveler. Uh, he is looking at the Sphinx and he can't understand what it means. He can't read hieroglyphs. He can't understand any of the wisdom of the past. So with this, this mural, this is showing this human aspiration to look into the past, to learn from the past. Uh, we do that with books. We do that with the ability to record that knowledge, pass it on, uh, and house it in libraries. This last one over here, uh, this is the myth of Jason, Prince of Thessaly, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, the stories in Greek myths. Uh, in one, he is tasked with finding the Golden Rams, please. The Golden Rams Fleece, of course, in the ancient world represented uh, commercial supremacy and wealth. He sets off on this quest. It is said that there is a dragon guarding, guarding the Golden Ram Fleece. Uh, he brings along, uh, the myth says he brings along a sorcerer that eventually casts a spell. And when he arrives at the dragon's lair, the dragon is asleep. Uh, and the, 
the myth goes that he's able to capture the Golden Ram Fleece without incident. Uh, in this mural, he's displaying it. He's got the commercial supremacy uh, and the wealth of the, the uh, ancient world. But in the background, we see the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty is also displaying her torch, the Torch of Liberty. And so with this, this is this, is this human aspiration to uh, have commercial wealth, um, to achieve status, um, to seek freedom. Um, and this is the, the, the Statue of Liberty is, is displaying her torch, offering that chance to capture the Golden Ram Fleece to all the people. So back to the question, someone asked why, why did the library and the museum move out of here? Uh, in 19, the early 1970s, Nelson, uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller is envisioning this grand center of New York State government, uh, and he, he has a plan to construct the Empire State Plaza, and that was going to be the headquarters for New York State government. So a lot of the offices are consolidated to the buildings there, and the Culture Education Center, where I work in the museum, that was designated for where the library and the museum was going to go. But like I mentioned before, th this building still uh, is still in the active, uh, the, the employees are still active here in the, the New York State Education Department. They just get to inherit all these lovely spaces. So thanks for that question. We're going to turn the corner here. By the way, the, the, the rotunda paintings we just looked at there's actually 36 in total, and if you're interested in looking at more of the ones I talked about or, or some of the interpretations behind the others, or just a chance to see the others, uh, you can Google the rotunda paintings at the New York State Education Building, and you can find the site uh, to look at. Uh, but we wanted to show you uh, this behind me. This is an actual scale model of the building, so if you're not able to, uh, to see the building, um, this is what it looks like from the outside. Um, and this is here on the second floor. This is actually model that was constructed by Henry Hornbostel and his architectural firm in New York City, Palmer and Hornbostel. This was their submission to New York State for the plan for the building. And obviously when, when the planners saw this, when Draper saw this, they realized that this, this is going to be the design that they want. As I mentioned, it looks like a Greek temple uh, from the outside. And being across the street from the New York State Capitol, another thing that was important was the building so should have a different style. They didn't want it to look like the Capitol. Uh, they wanted it to be distinct. I mentioned that this was going to be the headquarters uh, for the New York State Education Department, and part of the original plan was this building was a symbol. People would see it, and they would be in awe of this construction uh, in, in different columns. So we have time. We're going to answer some questions. So you can send those in right now. And because of our technical difficulty, we will also answer questions in the comments on the original video. So uh, we'll wait a second more and try to give you another view of what the SED building looks like from the outside. One thing that's very different from normal buildings of this, of this type is you'll notice that the entablature, which is the section above the columns, makes up the frieze and the corners. The entablature here is very high. Uh, this is something that is a departure from standard practice, standard classical architecture. The, uh, it was criticized when people saw this plan, but Hornbostel realized that he would be constructing this building on a, on a city block, and the, and the building would be obstructed from across the street. Today we have this lovely panoramic view, but the Capitol had buildings and structures going all the way up to its front steps. So Hornbostel knew that people would be seeing this coming up and down Washington Avenue. So he felt that if he had this long series of columns, there's 36 in total, uh, he felt that if he stuck to the norms and the classical architecture specifications, uh, that the end tablature, if he kept it not as this high, it would look rather weak. Uh, raising it gives this, this facade it's a striking building, and you see it as you approach it. And we do have a question. Is the rotunda shown on the model? The rotunda is not shown on the model. So this, this was an exterior model, of course, during those times when, when a building, in this case where the building was selected uh, to be constructed, the next point uh, 
for the architects would be to come up with the interior plan. So that was all done after. All right, we're back. I just wanted to follow up on uh, the question uh, that someone had the asked about how long it took to construct the building. The building con uh, was constructed over the course of four years, began in 1908, and it was completed in 1912. Uh, but I'm in, I'm in the lovely staircase right here, vestibule staircase, which is another nice architectural feature that's here in the building, and of course, one of the original signs of the city. So, we have any more questions? All right, everyone, thanks for joining me today. My name is Carl Marone. I hope you enjoy taking a look at that in the second floor of Tunney, where, as I mentioned, this is only one of the spaces that we have that are in the New York City Education Building. <clears throat> There's lots of other spaces to see. There's other artwork to see. Uh, maybe we will see you on a future tour with that. So, thanks for joining us today on uh, field trips to the New York City Museum. We will see you next week 